Welcome to Brisbane, and in particular to my exhibition of 30 paintings and 10 poems. The paintings are in oil, acrylic, pastel, and collage. And I hope you enjoy it. This is the only one behind glass. It's a small pastel, and it's um, a drawing of the Statue of Liberty's face in heavy shadow. And in fact, the painting is called Shadows. Um, it has no particular significance to me, except for the composition and the actual structure of the painting itself. This particular drawing is one that Kathy rather likes and it may well finish up hanging on her wall. This painting is called Rocky Desert. It was painted towards the end of my stay in Saudi Arabia, as with the other desert scene, which we'll see in a second. Um, it was basically showing a, a dawn. Some people have commented about the, the interesting colors just behind the, the rocks in the foreground, as though there's something going on just behind the rocks. I don't know whether that's the case or whether in fact it was uh, paint that was misapplied, but it certainly gives rather an interesting effect. The rocks themselves are slightly textured. Uh, the next painting is far more interesting in the, in the textural regard. This is the second picture that was painted towards the end of my stay in Saudi Arabia. And this one is called Sandy Desert, even though there, there are lots of um, uh, outcrops and, and uh, large cliffs involved. The, the, the middle ground, in fact, is Sandy Desert. And this painting is quite interesting insofar as it's textured. It's very highly textured in the foreground here. These escarpments, in fact, are textured with Saudi Arabian sand mixed in with the paint, and it gives a rather a gravelly feel to the picture. I'm rather fond of this painting, and uh, it, it conjures up nostalgic memories of Saudi Arabia, not from the end of my stay, though, but from the beginning, because this sort of rock formation was a sort of... Um, the inspiration for this, in fact, was, wasn't during daylight, it was moonlight, driving back from a desert trip at night up um, some very, very steep wadis and observing rock formations of this particular type. Whilst in Saudi Arabia, um, I was driving through the desert one day with a friend of mine, and there was a sandstorm blowing. And in the midst of the sandstorm, we observed this camel, which had been caught short. And as a result of that, that stimulated sufficient interest to write a poem to my young daughters, which struck me possibly, as a, in retrospect, as a, perhaps rather a, um, a, an inappropriate thing to do, but it seemed reasonable at the time. And the poem is, is here displayed with the Saudi Arabian paintings just to knit them together. And the poem runs like this. A lonely, beast, a lonely life the desert affords. The camel, the desert, in life he lords. A hopeful company, some may say, whilst walking alone, always holds sway. The camel, a high-born beast, occasionally finds cactus upon to feast. These spiky delights his taste buds adore. Unlike his insides, their reactions abhor. A haughty beast he stands for long, enduring the rigors of a wild sandstorm, as down his large intestine pass, machinated cactus to the camel's ass. A smart beast, though, you will agree, nose to the wind as it's plain to see, lids tight closed and tail held high, the camel at peace about to let fly. Some people say that camels are dumb, but examine the way he protects his bum. When in a sandstorm all caught short, dread grittiness avoids without contort. Scarce waters in these sandy climes, part dis parch discharge as metallic chimes, downwind emerge quite round, to light of day, cannonade as shrapnel and ricochet. This painting is one of six scarecrow paintings I did in the late 70s, and it's always proven to be the most popular um, from comments that people have made about it. I rather like it because it has volume, and it has more character than, than the uh, remaining five paintings. People often ask about this barbed wire, for instance, the significance of that. I don't know if it has any significance. It certainly didn't when I painted it. In truth, I am only that which you see. Twee hat, silk scarf, Stuffed shirt, that's me. Head made mealy straw, tight binded with twine. 
whose free yellow thoughts, herbaceous but mine, whilst you, who godlike created this form, possess powers unimagined since the heavens were born, each the capacity to romance reason and see can escape the bourgeois, become a grandee. How many, though I wonder, blind viewers remain, who during life's seasons cultivate a fallow brain, never question the claptrap, nor voice an opinion, make lie to the process renowned as Darwinian. I've painted probably six or seven portraits, of which these three were, were entered into the Doug Moran portrait competitions. And this painting was entered in uh, 1990, and it's a, a portrait of my eldest daughter, Gillian. Uh, it was supposed to be a painting where she was phoning back from somewhere abroad, and what I did is I used a Gauguin background as the backdrop for Gillian supposedly phoning home in a homesick mood from a holiday in, in, uh, in Tahiti. The second portrait is a, a painting of a, from a friend of mine in the early 80s, and she posed for the second of the Doug Moran entrance that I put in in 1992. After the painting was finished, I was obliged to paint in her engagement ring because she'd just got re-engaged to somebody she'd broken um, her engagement off with six months previously. The third and final portrait is of uh, Sam, and uh, that was entered in the Doug Brown competition earlier this year. And I think in lots of ways it's possibly the finest of the, of the portraits I've done to date. Particularly the hair I find nice and loose, although her hair is in fact a lighter colour than that. The Jazz Man is a relatively small painting, uh, rather colourful, and the main interest in this painting is the textural difference between the curtains, the flesh, and of course the metal and the instrument. And the bell, which you can now see, was the part which actually presented the most problem to get the reflections correct. Animal named the players, baited in the pit. Insiders get the money, punters get the writ. Both service selected blue chips, stoking optimistic passion. Bears gorge sweet pink smoked salmon, shorting pessimistic fashion. Margins tempt an arbitrage as premiums hit a peak. Corrections lure the fisherman, large rebounds for to seek. Commodities of all shades find outlet in the ring. Hedges cover exposure, speculators insurance bring. All the world is at it, borders no frontier, Governments twitch and tremble if currency weakness appear. Volatile indices soaring, which often overshoot, whilst so-called informed sources make off with all the loot. Professor Lovelock uh, proposed a theory of Gaia, which basically states that without life on Earth, life couldn't exist on Earth. It sounds a bit circular, but basically what it means, if there was no life on Earth, undertaken chemical actions in the atmosphere, the atmosphere would degenerate and oxidation would go so that life could not exist on Earth. The fact that it does makes it persist. And these paintings behind me are Gaia 1, 2 and 3, uh, the first in a series of paintings which I intend to do on Gaia, Mother Earth. Fares and Joe are still life which I rather enjoy. The stroke such a small thing it seems, a capillary or two. But when one bursts, as they're inclined to do, the merest drop of red blood's intrusion may bequeath the brain of frightful confusion. Pig's heads may appear to be rather a strange topic for a painting. However, I like it. I can't explain why I painted it in the first place. The colors are rather nice. Most people like them. I like it as a painting. In fact, it was going to be called The Smiles That Launched 2,000 Pork Sausages, but in fact it's called Butchery. The Conformist, some people thought it should be called The Nonconformist, but the idea behind this painting was that a free spirit is born but becomes pigeonholed by virtue of life squeezing them into a, a pattern and slotting them into, a, into their little square where they remain unless they can break free and once again become a free spirit. 
Politics. The politics game of personal power. Illusionists play with minds that sour, whose elixir's thirst is never quenched. So clowns and fools become from benched. Soapbox now default is stage. TVs brought their image of age. Powdered nose masks sweaty shine. Sharpened teeth for smile divine. Humblest hobble their snout intrudes. Close up glisten as greed exudes. Hunger's all consuming thought. Ambition will always the truth distort. None of this the powerful say hurt the people in any way, just in heart and soul and mind, shrouded in magic of every kind. Lobbyists pray, perform each show. Addicts grip, holds honesty low. Conjurers whirl, rabbits appear, deceit, deception, and mirrors here. Brightest star, oh brilliance blinding, twist and turn in contortions binding, levitate and leap with movements hypnotic. The ringleader, of course. Direction? Quixotic. The paintings we're looking at now have in common the fact that they're quite angular. The first painting, in fact, is a collage. It's called packaging, and the reason for that is, it, is that the main, the main collage on the, on, the, on the canvas is the packaging from three shirts that I bought in a Christmas sale. The next painting is Craig Niche, which in fact probably is the most popular painting here. Certainly it's the one that Maggie likes best of all, and she's asked me to leave it to her in my will, but of course I explained that wasn't possible because she'd be dead before me. And the third one is called Clash, which is self-explanatory. This painting is called Divorce, and the poem that was written to accompany it is called Seasons. All fresh and new, bird, animal, and tree. Sweet flowers perform, the hum of the bee. Love's chance encounter, romance's soft kiss. Spring's perfect song, life's duet of bliss. United in purpose by rituals blessed, builds neatly a nest, secure and protected. Balmy soft air, herb scented, so heady. Greedy plump chicks, movements hesitant. Unsteady. Dark skies do gather, leaves crackle and drift. Nest now neglected, young soar on sure lift. Time for departure as temperatures fall. Cold distance and darkness now separate all. Knife edge the wind, trees skeletal bare. Howls I see the chorus of chill and despair. What brought it to this? Who pointed the bow? Scattered and empty, no body at home. Samantha and Gillian, very much like the horseman. The Bagman, with the accompanying poem called Louvre Metro. Reflections of Egypt haunt the cavernous tomb, counterfeit art neath Europe's cultural womb, originals baggage for Pharaoh's ascendants, copies adornment for Louvre Metro resplendence. No clattering contraption, nor cast iron relic, no howling banshee, nor transport angelic. Mere soft seated comfort, swift, silent, and smooth, moves travelers and pilgrims to Gare de la Louvre. Aboard the bright train, each clutching a docket, crowded isolation. Beware the pickpocket. Sweeps from the blackness, then groans to a halt. Staccato sharp echoes, swift heels flee the vault. As midnight is sounded, chilled silence descends. Alone on the platform, a bundle unbends. A stiff, ragged mummy into overcoat skins. The bagman is moving, his night's vigil begins. Serious games. Cigar smoke lingers as stakes are raised, elegantly dressed, but with vision glazed, retreat to confer with insiders few, assessing the game about to ensue. Delaying tactics, ordered, not hasty, as rich and powerful maneuver to safety, reviewing alternatives for subtle position, dividend enrichment by official requisition. 
border incursion or broadcast insult designed to infuriate, provoking tumult. Motivation enough mobilizes the troops, hoodwinked and played the masses of dupes. Professional or conscript, differences blurred. Officer or squaddy, similarities absurd. Bellboy recast as frontline man, dapper subaltern schooled a gentleman. Irony exists in every place. Society, the military, paradox embrace. Wealthy, the poor en masse defend. Deprived, the rich to war do send. Of soldiers, the prisoner of law and command. Spill blood and die, red spattered the sand. Protectors reward for castrated ambition, a fistful of granite, a memorial inscription. Confused and dejected, battered and twisted, survived lunatic antics, headquarters enlisted, praying and killing and praying again, emotions exhausted, trying to stay sane. When it's all over, the killing all done, the ranks demobbed, the dole queues begun, one question persists, what benefit all that? State secret, insists the blue blood diplomat. This rather strange picture is called The Couple. And this other rather strange painting is called Left and Right. And there's a poem that accompanies that called On the Other Hand. Once socialist dogma, eternal, dangerous, yet trite, droned numbingly a slogan, the left only is right. Now capitalist messiahs of conscience bereft sponsor laissez-faire's prophecy, the right solely be left. This painting and poem have the same name, the convert. Born a child, plump and round, cradled in softness, eyes heavenward bound. Warm and secure in Luther's fair land, now Christ's with the Kaiser, changes at hand. Young thoughts are molded, taking all in, preached at and praying to alleviate sin, nurtured vocation in heavenly cause, devotional study, Jehovah's great laws. Pastor's conviction in sermon's furor, ruralist quiet beside the great war. Eulogist chorus for coffins of stenches, buries the debris straight out of the trenches. Lunatic conflict and now reparation, out of control amid hyperinflation. Cultural turmoil, more death and despair, evaporate souls into frozen thin air. Aristocrat's replacement, a man of the people, brown-shirted rejoicing rings out from each steeple, tight-faced and strutting, godlike to some. Now it's official, death's messiah has come. Renaissance of beggars to nation of plenty, clerics' conversion to God supplementary. Olds by fanatics with flashes resplendent, swastika sash over crucifix pendant. Myopic perspective through monocle vision. Just following orders? No, a personal decision. Dictator's obsession, the final solution, genocide, the cleric gave mock absolution. Unrepentantly stony, red-faced and sinister, reflections of hell catch the regiment's minister. Hypocrisy's mask, both full face and profile, officially pardoned was death said Gentile. I once bought a painting from a friend of mine, and this, this artist eventually came to stay at my house for a week, and whilst he was staying there, he repainted this painting that I bought from him. He changed some of the flowers. So I painted this to uh, try to capture the background in his painting. We're coming to the end of the exhibition, and after Shy Doris, there's one more painting. The spirited life is so called because it's about the effects of drink. The king himself is actually hollow and will hold a bottle of whiskey, and the bottle of whiskey is there, of course. The glass is one from Elsie Robinson's house by hand. And the effect in the background is that when you've had too much to drink, you see double, a double vision. And there's the real thing. Well, that's the total spectrum of the exhibition. I hope you've thoroughly enjoyed it. I certainly have. Happy days. <laughs>